Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing folate antagonist antibiotics. Okay, so in the previous video what we discussed is the sulfonamide antibiotics and how they work. And we saw that the way that the sulfonamides work is that they inhibit this enzyme dihydroterate synthetase inside bacterial cells and this enzyme is important in the biosynthetic pathways for folic acid. Okay, so by blocking this enzyme, you block the synthesis of folic acid, hence why sulfonamides are considered folate antagonist antibiotics, because they uh, antagonize the folate pathway. Now remember, folic acid is so important because it's essential for the function of the enzymes which make RNA and DNA nucleotides, and without the function of those enzymes, you're not going to make DNA and RNA nucleotides. Without DNA and RNA nucleotides, you can't synthesize DNA and RNA, hence you can't make proteins, and you can't replicate your genome, hence you can't divide. So that's why the sulfonamides have a bacteriostatic effect. In this video, what I want to start off with is a discussion of sulfonamide resistance in bacteria, which is a big problem and which now uh, hugely limits the use of the sulfonamide antibiotics. Uh, then what I want to do is discuss the other example of a folate antagonist antibiotic, uh, which is trimethoprim. Okay, so uh, let's discuss resistance then to sulfonamides. So resistance, how does it actually occur? Well. In the bacterial cells that are resistant to sulfonamides, so if I have, let's say, a bacterial cell here, okay, and I chuck sulfonamide antibiotics at it, and they have absolutely no effect, then of course I would call it a sulfonamide-resistant bacterial cell. It still divides away quite happily, okay, uh, its folate uh, synthesis pathways aren't blocked, it therefore is a sulfonamide-resistant uh, bacterial cell. Uh, what actually is allowing it to resist the effects of my sulfonamides? Why are my sulfonamides not uh, having the effect they should on the dihydroterate synthetase enzymes in this resistant bacterial cell? Well, resistant bacterial cells, we have found that they have a new form of the enzyme. Okay, so I'll draw this here. They have a modified form of the dihydroterate synthetase enzyme, so I'll draw it now in red here, and I have a new red pen. Okay, so uh, here is this new form of the dihydroterate synthetase enzyme. So again, this is DHPS, but this is a slightly modified form. And now the slightly modified form, this slightly modified form of the dihydroterate synthetase enzyme, it's no longer sensitive to the sulfonamides. They cannot bind to it anymore and competitively inhibit the access of para-aminobenzoic acid anymore. Okay, so the sulfonamides become totally useless. Now, how did the bacterial cell acquire the ability to make this new form of dihydroterate synthetase that is resistant to sulfonamides? Well, it's encoded in plasmid DNA. So remember, bacterial cells, they generally have a huge great genome, which is circular, so they have a massive great chromosome, which is a circular chromosome, so it's very different to our chromosomes. In our chromosomes, human chromosomes, we of course have 46 of them. Again, the DNA is a massive great linear piece of DNA, a huge great piece of linear DNA, but linear. It doesn't fold back on itself. In the case of bacterial chromosomes, the thing folds around into a great big loop. Okay, so this in red here, this is supposed to represent my major portion of this bacterial cell genome, which is the chromosomal DNA. So usually bacterial cells have one or two chromosomes. Okay, so I'll just show this one with a single chromosome. So this is the chromosomal DNA. But remember, bacterial cells can also have tiny little loops of DNA as well that are in addition to the chromosomal DNA. And these little loops of DNA that are much smaller than the great big loop of the chromosomal DNA here, these are known as plasmids. Now, uh, bacterial cells can have a huge number of different plasmids, and they can acquire them from other bacterial cells. Uh, so there's this phenomenon of bacterial conjugation, where bacterial cells give plasmids to neighboring bacterial cells, so they can interchange their plasmid genomes. Okay, so the new form of the dihydroterate synthetase enzyme, which is no longer affected by the sulfonamide antibiotics, the gene that encodes it is in a plasmid. 
Okay, so originally in the bacterial population, so if we look at all the bacteria on the planet, long before the use of sulfonamide antibiotics, so let's go back into the 19th century before we'd used the sulfonamide antibiotics, if we looked at the entire bacterial population on the planet then, okay, and gone to all the different forms of bacterial species that infect humans, the presence of this plasmid containing this new form of dihydroterate synthetase, which was not going to be affected by sulfonamide antibiotics, would have been very rare. So very few bacterial cells would have actually had this plasmid with this new form of dihydroterate synthetase in. However, what happens, of course, when you apply a selection pressure, which we did, when you start using a huge number of sulfonamide antibiotics against bacterial populations, you apply a huge, great selection pressure, and then it's just Darwinian evolution. You kill off all the bacterial cells that do not have this new form of dihydroterate synthetase, uh, because they are going to no longer be able to... Well, you don't kill them, of course. You, it's bacteria static. Uh, you, damage their reproductive potential, however. Um, you stop them from being able to divide, which obviously damages their reproduction. The ones which do have uh, the um, new form of dihydroterate synthetase, they will now divide more than the ones that have not got it, and therefore they will, their frequency in the population, their, the proportion of the population with uh, dihydroterate synthetase of this new kind will increase over time. Okay, so it's classical Darwinian uh, evolution of the population. So the population overall then evolves so that this trait of having this dihydroterate synthetase, which isn't affected by the sulfonamide antibiotics, uh, becomes more prevalent. Okay, because it enables the bacterial cell to better survive and reproduce in the environment, in this environment where humans are chucking these horrible drugs at them. Okay, right, so that's what has happened. Darwinian evolution has occurred. The proportion of bacterial cells in the population with this modified form of dihydroterate synthetase, which is resistant to sulfonamide antibiotics, has hugely increased, uh, and now uh, often when you chuck sulfonamide antibiotics at a certain uh, population of bacteria that are maybe causing some disease, they might not kill, well, they might not have an effect on uh, a, a huge number of them, which do indeed have this dihydroterate synthetase, which isn't affected by sulfonamides. So there is sulfonamide uh, resistance in bacterial cells. Let's now move on to uh, the mechanism by which trimethoprim, this other folate antagonist antibiotic, actually works. Okay, so trimethoprim. Now, trimethoprim is often abbreviated down to TMP. Okay, and it's also going to work by affecting the folate pathway. However, it's going to work at a later stage than the sulfonamides. So the sulfonamides worked by stopping the synthesis of folic acid by inhibiting dihydroterate synthetase within the bacterial cells. Trimethoprim is going to work to stop folic acid actually having the uh, effect that we want it to have. So remember, folic acid is important in the bacterial cells because we need it for the enzymes that um, make the nucleotides of DNA and RNA to actually work. But in fact, that's an oversimplification. I'm going to now make the story slightly more complicated and slightly closer to the truth. It is not folic acid quite that those enzymes need. Instead, it is a form of folic acid known as tetrahydrofolate, okay, or tetrahydrofolic acid. So, in fact, what needs to happen is folic acid needs to be converted firstly into dihydrofolate or dihydrofolic acid. Now, let me just establish what the difference between folate and folic acid is, and nicely we have the picture of folic acid here. Okay, so folate and folic acid, what is the difference between uh, these two? Uh, folate is the conjugate base of folic acid, so it's just acids and alkalis and bases and all of that. Uh, so here we have seen the reason that folic acid is indeed an acid. It has these two carboxylic acid groups, one here and another one here. Okay, and these are capable of donating protons away into solution. Now, the molecule, when it has the protons attached to it, that is known as folic acid. Okay, 
that is actually capable of donating protons away into solution. However, once it has actually donated the protons away into solution, and you now have the negative charges on these oxygen atoms here, that is no longer called folic acid. The reason is it's no longer an acid. It can't actually donate any protons away into solution anymore because it already has donated its protons away into solution. It doesn't have any more protons to give. That is now called folate. So folate is what's known as the conjugate base of folic acid. Uh, it's the folic acid once it's actually donated its protons away into solution. Once it's actually done what acids do, the thing that's left over is called the conjugate base because actually it's no longer an acid, it's a base. Because onto these oxygens with the negative charges, you can actually put protons from solution. And such molecules which can accept protons from solution are known as bases. So in fact, all acids, once they've donated their proton away, become a base. And that's known as the conjugate base of an acid. Okay, so folate is just the name for the folic acid molecule once it's donated its protons away into solution. Now, under physiological pH, a lot of the folic acid molecules will donate their protons away into solution, and therefore will exist as folate molecules rather than folic acid molecules, which is why people often talk about folate rather than folic acid. However, to all extents and purposes, folic acid and folate are the same molecule. They're the two sides of the same coin, if you like. Okay, so that's why people often refer to folate over folic acid. So, I'll put this here. Folic acid, or folate, is going to be converted into dihydrofolic with folate, which you could call dihydrofolic acid if you wished. Okay, which will then be converted into tetrahydrofolate. People usually uh, just use folate rather than folic acid, but you could, again, in tetrahydrofolate, replace the folate with folic acid. Uh, it would not be wrong to do that. Okay, and for short, DHF stands for dihydrofolate, and tetrahydrofolate is shortened down to THF, like so. Okay, and it is THF that is really important for the function of those enzymes which are uh, going to synthesize nucleotides. So, in order to actually use folate, to actually um, help these enzymes which are going to produce the nucleotides of DNA and RNA, you have to firstly convert it into dihydrofolate and then into tetrahydrofolate. And trimethoprim is going to inhibit the enzyme which carries out these conversions here. And the enzyme which carries out these conversions is known as dihydrofolate reductase, or DHFR. So this enzyme is known as dihydrofolate reductase. So inside the bacterial cells they have this enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase which converts the folate, folic acid, and I'm trying to now combine folic acid and folate uh, together in my head, so excuse me if I make that mistake again. Uh, so they're go it's going to convert folic acid molecules into dihydrofolic acid molecules which are then going to be converted into tetrahydrofolic acid molecules and the tetrahydrofolic acid molecules are now the molecules that are actually essential for the function of those enzymes which create the nucleotides for DNA and RNA. Okay, trimethoprim, this antibiotic, is going to go into the bacterial cells and it's going to inhibit the dihydrofolate reductase enzyme and therefore stop the conversion of folic acid molecules into tetrahydrofolate molecules. You're therefore going to run out of tetrahydrofolate molecules and um, the enzymes which create the nucleotides of DNA and RNA are therefore going to stop working and you will therefore have the exact same effect as the sulfonamides had. You will have a bacteriostatic effect. Okay, so trimethoprim is also therefore referred to as a folate antagonist, the reason being that it antagonizes the folic acid pathway. It attacks the bacterial cells, it stops them being able to divide by damaging their handling of folic acid. Okay, right. What I want to end this video on then is just mentioning a really important combination, which is the drug cotrimoxazole. Okay, and you'll often hear about this drug. It's often prescribed. Cotrimoxazole is the combination for sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, and often some people also write cotrimoxazole as SMX slash TMP, because it's sulfamethoxazole, which is, as I told you earlier, abbreviated down to 
SMX uh, with trimethoprim, which is abbreviated down to TMP. So cotrimoxazole, it's the combination of sulfamethoxazole, a powerful sulfolamide, with trimethoprim, these two folate antagonist antibiotics. And sulfamethoxazole will inhibit dihydroteroate synthetase, uh, trimethoprim will inhibit dihydrofolate reductase, they'll inhibit both parts of the folate uh, pathway here, uh, therefore you'll have a double effect and you really will uh, stop the production of tetrahydrofolate and therefore you really will damage the performance of these enzymes which are involved in synthesizing nucleotides and together they will have a stronger bacteriostatic effect than individually. Okay, so cotrimoxazole, that's the combination of trimethoprim, so the trim is for trimethoprim, and the oxazole is then the ending of sulfamethoxazole. Okay, and with that, I will finish this video on folate antagonist antibiotics. I hope that you have learned how the uh, folate antagonist antibiotics actually achieve a bacteriostatic effect, and you understand that these antibiotics will be useful in people whose immune system is up to the job of getting rid of the bacterial infection once you've stopped it getting any worse, okay? But if you are dealing with someone who uh, is immunosuppressed and whose immune system is not up to the job of clearing the bacterial infection once you've stopped it getting any worse, uh, then you will need a bactericidal antibiotic, which these two uh, classes are not. Okay, so we'll end the video there.